Dear Sir, I am persuaded to write to you concerning aid to unemployment. I hope this movement will be speeded up so that people in Pottstown will feel and know the results before cold weather comes upon us. A struggling, starving working class, undernourished men, women, and children. I hope that Wall Street will never have the power again to cause such a panic upon the people. I hope the guilty gang will be punished before they die. By 1932, the United States was three years into the worst economic depression in our nation's history. Since the crash of 1929, banks were continuing to fail week by week. Countless hard-working American families had lost most or all of their life savings. The entire system of money and finance had broken down seemingly overnight. The nation's citizens watched helplessly as once productive men and women were forced to sit idle or wander the country on trains or on foot in a desperate search for work. Farmers lost all means to plant and plow forcing them to abandon their properties. On a single day in April 1932, one-fourth of the entire area of the state of Mississippi was sold off at auction, and the devastation only grew. Rural America rotted. Whole sections of the country were plagued by natural disasters and suffered the outbreak of diseases. Americans were left to fend for themselves, even as they pleaded to the deaf ears of President Hoover to escape this economic misery. Dear Sir, Surely it is a most heart-rending life of poverty cast upon capable workers by unintelligent, cold-blooded ruling of our native country. You money-grubbers who have it all, you men must answer for degraded selfishness I hope to God your backbone will be scratching your stomachs from emptiness before you die. God's vengeance will be a cruel deal to all of you guilty. What had caused this unprecedented misery? Who was to blame for this crisis? which had ruined the lives and broken the spirit of the once proud American people. After World War I, the protective tariffs and parity prices enacted to build industry for the war effort, which had ensured federal protection of agriculture, had been systematically torn down. A takedown that was led by the efforts of a private class of citizenry who were unquestionably honorable men. This class of private financiers, operating through their investment banks, had launched a speculative boom during the early 20s with the creation of a stock market and real estate bubble. The game was largely fueled by the goodwill of the American citizenry who deposited their savings in commercial banks. Little did the citizens know that Wall Street investment houses claimed the right to use their savings as collateral in their speculative schemes. This cancerous bubble soon exploded. The very existence of the nation was threatened. 
and Americans had no protection. There was no specific law at that time to ban this criminal activity between investment and commercial banks, as policies such as the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933 had yet to be enacted. Look, what you had was a vast series, the same thing we see today. Oh, it had a different quality to it, but otherwise the, the situation was essentially the same. For example, you had banks taking deposit money and investing it in the stock market or investing it in other forms of securities in a completely unregulated manner. And they were speculating as we've seen. See, here, the problem people have to really get is there is an irrationality in this. They're not geniuses. Okay? They really do operate at a certain point in a sort of manic fit on the idea that this system's going to go forever. And so if we need to, if we go into debt and we speculate on something, you know, we can find the way to speculate on something else to maintain this debt if we have to. And so they speculated in, in securities, they speculated in uh, real estate values, farms that were being bought up and cartelized. So you had a massive speculative binge in the 1920s, which in its character, even though it was a little bit more limited, okay, but in its character was the same as today. We, we had bank holding companies that were li literally looting the money out of banks, out of insurance companies, to squeeze margins of profits out of making uh, deals on investments or their own speculation. So that really is the character of it. And indeed, it began to shut down industry. It began to shut down real production. Public rage began to mount as working Americans, suffering unimaginable poverty, watched while these few wealthy bankers enjoyed lives of great decadence. The nation began to realize that these so-called businessmen had merely been stealing their hard-earned life savings and using it to play the markets. And, all the while the people also watched as their U.S. government was controlled by a dark and concerted conspiracy of this private group of bankers who operated unrestricted and unregulated from the brokerage firms and law offices on the southern tip of New York's Manhattan. Once I built a railroad, made it run, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? Kuhn Loeb, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, Brown Brothers Harriman, and of course, J.P. Morgan and Company, were just some of the most recognized names of what had become an American elite. They had no loyalties to the nation of the United States, as any astute observer could tell. In 1926, Senator Smith Brokart of Iowa was invited to an affair held by the financiers at Kuhn Loeb. <laughs> I felt so out of place. I was the only one there dressed like an American citizen. In the 1920s, the financial power of these Wall Street bankers grew like a cancerous tumor, grabbing increasing control over the nation and the government. My idea of New York, and by that I mean the controlling interest there, is that they sit back and look upon the rest of the country much as Great Britain looks upon India. There had been congressional attempts to break the power of Wall Street earlier by investigations such as the Peugeot Committee of 1912, but the legislative actions taken were never sufficient to halt its unconstitutional operations. One of the biggest targets of criminal investigation was always the financial empire of J.P. Morgan, whose bankers sat on the boards and directorships of a vast number of America's industries and firms. No other association was as British as J.P. Morgan in its overseas networks, business deals, and mannerisms. Jack Morgan, who always felt more at home in Britain, owned an estate in a township just north of London, whose villagers paid fealty to this Wall Street banker. 
this European-styled banker's aristocracy shaped the trends and opinions of this so-called American elite. While the rural United States fell into poverty, cut off from electricity, and living in 19th century conditions, stockbrokers of the Eastern establishment lived like squires, bred polo ponies, and hunted foxes. But it was not just the mannerisms which made firms like J.P. Morgan decidedly un-American. There was something much more nefarious in the unbelievable concentration of private wealth and the control that this class exerted over governments and entire nations. My special job is the most interesting I know of anywhere. More fun than being king or pope or prime minister anywhere. No one can turn me out of it, and I don't have to make any compromises with principles. What does the fascist say? Your children mean nothing. The most important thing is to keep the financial system going. That's the one that we all have to exist for. And if we die for that, that's just the nature of the system. That's just the way the world works. Think like an animal. Gain your pleasures, avoid pain, and if you have to, eat your neighbor, like a good animal does. And the system, the market, will work out those relations and th those who are better will come out ahead. And everything will be organized from that standpoint. We will do nothing to touch it. We have no right to use our mind to intervene in the financial system. It's the most insane thing in the world. But if people think they're gonna get a short-term gain, and if you can focus people on their short, it's the same thing as sense perception, their short-term experience, if they lose a sense of the future and that we're responsible for the future and that the future can be better, then their minds shut down. And that's what this uh, fascist grip, this corporatist fascist grip, monetary value above all. See, once you get to this idea that the value of something is simply the monetary price ascribed to it by a financial process, a financial instrument, that we can take a human being's life and put a monetary value on it, as we do under the Obama death care. Once you've done that, then you've opened the door to hell, which we call fascism. The natural tendency of man is to reject such evil, refusing to lay down and accept economic rape. To stay in power, Wall Street and its British sponsors knew that political dictatorship was required in order to force nations and their citizens to accept such a parasitical regime. Thus, by the 1920s and early 30s, the royalty of Wall Street had begun to directly sponsor the rise of European fascism. When Italy found itself under the gun in 1926 to pay off its World War I debt, the Morgan Gang, operating through the presidency of Calvin Coolidge, quickly moved to secure a $100 million loan to the fascisti government of Benito Mussolini, who was praised by Wall Street as a sound economic leader and a tough politician who promised to balance the budget. Morgan bankers such as Thomas Lamont were, beyond a doubt, aware of what they were sponsoring. I wonder if you all in New York know just what you are doing in backing fascism in Italy. We had a taste of it last night here. A party of fascists motored up from Rome, armed with revolvers, rapiers, and loaded whips, arrived at nine and proceeded to beat up with fierce brutality the peasant who could not produce a fascist card. If any peasant objects, he is shot. This is happening all over the place. It seems funny for American money to be perpetuating it. In Germany, bankrupted by the reparations of the Versailles Treaty and the hyperinflation of 1923, 
The British Empire and its Wall Street clan nurtured the rise of Adolf Hitler. Though the Nazi party was only a marginal force, on the verge of bankruptcy in 1932, with Hitler already contemplating suicide, it was miraculously saved when Avril Harriman of Wall Street and Montague Norman of London ordered the managing director of Brown Brothers Harriman, Prescott Bush, to set up a money transfer to bail out Hitler's campaign for chancellor. London and Wall Street were determined to ensure Adolf Hitler's victory. And by 1933, they got what they wanted. Financiers and industrialists from British Wall Street scrambled to support the Nazis, paving the road for the Anschluss of Austria, the invasion of Poland, and the intent of taking over the entire Soviet Union. Rockefeller Standard Oil, American IG Chemical Corporation, Chase Bank, and Union Banking Corporation were all backing the Nazis, not just with money, but also with oil, gas, metal, rubber, and slavery. This was the culture of Wall Street on the eve of the 1932 election. When viewed in this perspective, it is clear that the mentality of this class of financiers was nothing less than purely evil. You could call it satanic. of his fellow men as Assistant Secretary of Navy in the First World War, as candidate for Vice President in 1920, and then as Governor of the State of New York for two terms. Achieving great national prominence, Franklin Roosevelt was nominated by the Democratic Convention of 1932 as candidate for President and was elected by a large majority. He came to office in a dark hour. Economic depression had gripped the world, affecting the lives of millions. In deciding to run for U.S. president, Franklin D. Roosevelt knew he was declaring warfare against these fascist enemies of the human race, even risking his life. A month prior to his official inauguration, Roosevelt had barely escaped the jaws of death, as five shots were fired at him while he was delivering a speech in Miami, Florida. He escaped death but Chicago Mayor Anton Cermak was wounded and died. Though the criminal conspiracy was never officially investigated, it is absolutely clear who would have benefited from the assassination of the incoming president. But, despite this, and the conspiracy of traitors within his own party, to rob him of his presidential nomination, Roosevelt enjoyed overwhelming popular support. And have abdicated practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of men. True, they have tried, but their efforts have been cast in the pattern of an outworn tradition. Faced by failure of credit, they have proposed only the lending of more money stripped of the lure of profit by which to induce our people to follow their false leadership, they have resorted to exhortations, pleading carefully for restored confidence. They only know the rules of a generation of self-seekers. They have no vision, and when there is no vision, the people perish. As the United States' newly elected president, Roosevelt took the evidence against Wall Street's criminals exposed by the Pecora Commission, and used it to garner a mass of public support for his economic battle plan. In his first four days in office, Roosevelt took on broad-reaching powers to handle the national emergency. First, 
issuing an executive order authorizing the March 1933 bank holiday to calm the panic and begin to restore both stability and federal control over the nation's banking system. Days later, Roosevelt's Emergency Banking Act was passed by Congress and would begin to reorganize the failed banks. In this way, Roosevelt reclaimed the constitutionally mandated control by the elected federal government of the nation's system of banking and finance. Because the speculation ultimately demands that some part of the income stream of the real population be used as the basis of the security for, under, for underwriting the whole speculative bubble. So Roosevelt knew this wasn't going to work. He had to get rid of all this, and he had to do it based on a nation-state principle, a sovereign nation-state principle. So when he came in, first of all, he refused to deal with Hoover. Hoover got very upset with this because Hoover was going to negotiate for Wall Street. Secondly, he did not go to the London Monetary Conference, which the London-based financial system sources were demanding he come to to try to negotiate some agreement on a further looting of, of the U.S. economy. And he said, no, we're not going. And he did a number of other things that have been sometimes used against him, but basically he was asserting the sovereignty of the U.S. national economy. And he was going to, he, he immediately came in with the idea of cleaning out the speculation. Now, uh, one interesting way to look at this is, is uh, in a later document in April uh, 29th of 1938, he sent a report to Congress where the very beginning of the report, I don't know if it's cooth for me to read it, but the very beginning of the report, he says, let me just give you a sense of this. Recommendations to the Congress to curb mon monopolies and the concentration of economic power. Unhappy events have retaught us two simple truths about the liberty of a democratic people. The first truth is that the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than the, than the democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism. Ownership of government by an individual, by a group, or by any other controlling private power. And that begins a 13-page document he sends to Congress where he identifies the financial investment houses, the financial institutions, the speculation, the securities bubbles. So he's, it, it, this is consistent. I mean, that's 38. But if you look at his looking forward book and you're looking at his early actions, this is the principle he's operating by. And he's already got in sight. I remember we discussed this a couple weeks ago. We, uh, he's already got in sight when he comes in on March the 4th, 1933, the implementation of the regulation that really comes in with the Banking Act two months later, the Banking Act of 1933, which includes Glass-Steagall. Out of this process of emergency reorganization came the most important policy to be enacted, the Glass-Steagall Act banishing the foxes from the chicken coop. No longer were the speculative and phony money games of the British Empire's investment houses, such as played by the crooks of J.P. Morgan, allowed to commingle with the legitimate and necessary functions of commercial banks. They were to be completely severed, by law, from all depository institutions. Any investment house officials that broke this law willfully were immediately subjected to financial penalties or jail. So he's coming in uh, in an emergency condition, and he has the power as the president. This is part of the presidency. So the, the, the principle that they were using was what they ultimately used in Glass-Steagall, which is this idea that speculative private financial interest, where you're simply basing a monetary bet and trying to control the future of an economy from that standpoint is destructive. It leaves human beings out. And we're going to distinguish that from real development. Then Roosevelt now wants to have this as the actual ongoing regulatory basis of the banking system. And so he moves to implement the proper legislation, which in a sense allows you to enforce a legal basis in, in constitutional law that allows you, which is that Glass-Steagall really is embedded in the Constitution. So 
The idea of a regulatory principle that distinguishes productive investment from private speculation is embedded in the, whole, in the federal constitution to begin with. Glass-Steagall is simply the legal basis upon which you carry out that, that constitutionally driven idea. With the banking system brought back into a state of order, by top-down supervision of the federal government, which banned Wall Street's speculative games under the new Glass-Steagall law, the country was put on the road to recovery. Musicians and singers, too, found employment in orchestral and vocal groups. These art singers, organized and directed by William Lawrence, have successfully presented a great many programs of classical music. Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, thank you very much for helping me to keep my house. If it wasn't for you, I know I would have lost it. You have saved my life. I will never forget you, and will always pray for you and your family. Forgive me if I caused you any trouble. I remain yours truly, Mrs. J.G. ...to assist materially in our already unmistakable march towards recovery. For the first time in five long years, the relief rolls have declined instead of increased during the winter months. The nation was and saved by Roosevelt's bold and decisive action, emerging not only victorious from the Great Depression, but also from the Second World War. FDR was determined to save the entire planet from the fascists that the British Empire and their partners had financed. At Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, delegates from 44 allied and associate countries arrived for the opening of the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference. Invited by President Roosevelt to the first major world financial meeting since the London Conference of As we approached the conclusion of World War II, of with the United States resort. standing as a shining example of the power of the constitutional principle of general welfare, Roosevelt sought to project that principle which lay at the core of the Glass-Steagall law across the globe in the form of the fixed exchange rate agreements and the intention for global development established during the Bretton Woods Conference of 1944. The complete implementation of Roosevelt's Bretton Woods would have finally destroyed the British creators of Wall Street. From his beloved second home at Warm Springs, Georgia, the body of Franklin Delano Roosevelt moves on the first stages of its journey to his final resting place. Scores of sufferers from infantile paralysis sorrowfully bid farewell to their great friend and benefactor. The president's dog follows his beloved master. Aboard a special train beginning the 24-hour trip back to Washington, the 31st President of the United States leaves Warm Springs forever. It was only Roosevelt's untimely death which derailed that future, a future free of colonialism and empires. Harry Truman, 
was a very different man. who love peace and liberty throughout the world, that I will support and defend those ideals with all my strength and all my heart. London and Wall Street celebrated when Franklin Roosevelt died. However, for them, Roosevelt's mortal death was not good enough. For them, it was only the beginning of the opportunity to end the political legacy and policy of our great American president. Today, our nation is in a breakdown crisis. After the death of President Roosevelt, the enemies of the United States Republic moved in to systematically dismantle every policy that made America the most powerful economy the world had ever seen. Roosevelt's productive machine was replaced by Wall Street's policies of British monetarism, the same policies that led to the Great Depression. Now, in this year of 2010, we have gone far beyond a depression. The United States and the world at large are facing the hyperinflationary disintegration of the entire world financial system, which threatens to plunge the whole of human civilization into a dark age. This is the collapse that physical economist Lyndon LaRouche had warned of for decades. Had his warnings been heeded, our planet would have realized and accomplished Franklin Roosevelt's post-war vision. Now, instead, we have entered the terminal phase of the present world system. The nut to be cracked is essentially this. We must virtually shut down Wall Street and what its associated financial monetary system implies, both in this nation and globally. And that means... They must immediately restore the full impact of the original 1933 Glass-Steagall measure, cancel the obligation to sustain a flow of monopoly game money into the inter-alpha apparatus, which now subsumes our own Wall Street and its errant swindlers, and divert the flow of credit presently being fed to a bailout operation into the guts of a physical recovery of our nation and its comp component states and municipalities. We must, therefore take a leaf out of President Franklin Roosevelt's 1933 book. To revive an economy whose living heart would soon cease breathing, even as in these little as weeks, were Barack Obama to remain in office, we must commit ourselves not merely to act in President Franklin Roosevelt's sense of urgency during some springtime summer 1933. We must take certain sweeping actions as he did then, to actually set the general economic recovery into motion. To understand in part the long-term menace which has blocked these initiatives, we turn your attention now to 1984. More than 50 years ago, a significant barrier to competition in the U.S. capital markets was erected by the Glass-Steagall Act, which barred commercial banks and their affiliates from underwriting and dealing in corporate securities. Since passing the act in 1933, 
Congress has not thoroughly examined whether Glass-Steagall has served any purpose that outweighs the public interest in promoting competition to achieve economic efficiency. Fundamental changes in our economy, important shifts in demand for financial services, and the resulting competition among different classes of financial institutions in recent years have produced what is aptly termed a revolution in financial services market. In this environment, competitive inequities inherent in the rigid segmentation of the financial industry provide another compelling reason to rethink Glass-Steagall. In their lordless year of 1984, the old fascists of London and New York saw a chance to finally dispose of the great burden which prohibited them from feeding their international empire. As in the 30s, the gang knew very well that their monetary system could only persist if they had a maximum ability to steal and loot. Alan Greenspan and Congressman Barney Frank would become the modern-day playboys for the international empire, with J.P. Morgan and company launching a war in December of 1984. Once we understood that Greenspan had come into the, that he had come into the Federal Reserve as a, as a passionate advocate of the repeal of Glass-Steagall, to be honest, it was not obvious to us, because we just weren't looking at it in this way, that by 98, 99, when you have the drive to repeal Glass-Steagall officially, that in effect, Glass-Steagall was already moot, and it was just a question of making it official. This study analyzes the major issues raised by proposals to allow bank holding company subsidiaries to underwrite and deal in corporate debt and equity securities. It first examines the arguments most commonly made to justify preservation of the artificial barriers to competition imposed by Glass-Steagall, and finds these arguments to have little merit. Historical research reveals that the Glass-Steagall Act did not play a major role in restoring the stability of the banking system. But I think it's really important that people think this thing through because when you consider that this was an effort that took place over the course of not 10 years or 15 years, but this is, this is an effort that goes on for a minimum of 50 years and actually longer. Because if you can understand that, then you understand why, why LaRouche has placed such a tremendous importance on Glass-Steagall. Because it really is at the very heart of the question of, of the integrity of U.S. national banking, as opposed to the kind of nonsense that goes on in Europe with, with the existence of a central bank. So the, the drive to repeal that bill uh, is, is something that has been unrelenting. And I think that the only way to really view it is as part of a general assault on the American system that has been in full swing since the death of Franklin Roosevelt. More than a dozen years prior to the internal release of Greenspan's Morgan pamphlet, Wall Street and the City of London were already hard at work trying to topple what remained of the Roosevelt legacy, pulling the strings of Richard Nixon through Arthur Burns and his protege George Pratt Schultz. The puppet masters organized Nixon to break the U.S. dollar from the gold reserve standard in August of 1971, thus burying Roosevelt's Bretton Woods agreements of 1944. The British were dedicated to breaking up the Bretton Woods system as much as they were dedicated to breaking up Glass-Steagall and they had the opportunity to do it first. And at the time, on August 15, 1971, Lyndon LaRouche wrote an editorial in uh, the newspaper at the time, New Solidarity, and basically said, Nixon's now finished. We are now seeing the beginning of an era of speculation where long-term strategic investment in the real economy will erode and where currencies will now be treated as commodities to be speculated on on futures markets. But, you know, the question of the strength of the dollar has never been based on a question of, uh, 
you know, of its, its speculative value in relation to other countries. The strength of the dollar has always been based on the strength of the nation. Uh, the strength of our nation to produce our our uh, our role as a as a global producer of of goods of of food of industrial uh, not only of industrial products but of ideas and the fact of the matter is that as the as the paradigm shift into post industrialism. Uh, really took more and more of a grip, uh, and you had the taking down of the physical economy of the United States, all that was left was the paper. With the fixed exchange rate system eliminated, national currencies were suddenly vulnerable to assault by the monetary manipulations of the empire, which now exercised power above nation-states. They created the circumstance by which they could determine the price and value of currencies at any given moment, with the ultimate aim of undermining and controlling the economies of sovereign governments. The British Empire then created an assault team known as the Inter-Alpha Group of Banks that same year to exploit the very vulnerability it had manipulated Nixon into creating. You have to understand that you have two different processes going on. One is what's going on in the financial system and the, the, the process of growth of speculation and of just massive increases in paper. That in and of itself would have caused massive problems. But at the same time that that was going on, what you also had was a very conscious policy of controlled disintegration of the physical economy. Now, in that context, then you have to look at the whole period of the 70s under Nixon and then under Jimmy Carter, who was a wholly owned product as president of the same Wall Street banking cartel. And the deregulation that ultimately led to the repeal of Glass-Steagall with the Graham Leach Bliley bill in 1999, had its most uh, recent urgent origins in the deregulation push under President Carter. Carter, with, with the start with uh, the rail and, and trucking deregulation, they passed the uh, Depository Institution Deregulation and Monetary Control Act of 1980. Now, this began to chop down the firewalls. It was a minimal step, but it was a, a foot in the door. It's sort of like the camel getting the nose un, under the tent. Once the camel's nose is under the tent, pretty soon the camel's going to be in the tent. Then the next step was the Garn St. Germain Act of 1982, which did away with the differentiation of savings and loans and commercial banks. Under the Roosevelt Glass-Steagall system, the savings and loans were given a special compensation for being mortgage institutions. That is, they, they had a fixed amount that they could charge in interest on loans, and in return also a fixed amount they would pay out on savings. Now, with the Garn St. Germain, all of a sudden savings and loans were told, now you can do the same thing that the commercial banks do. And the commercial banks, in turn, were allowed to start writing mortgages. And so between 82 and 86, the savings and loans, uh, against their better intentions, went into a total speculative uh, flight forward. Years before Alan Greenspan became U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman, he was already serving as a loyal asset of London to dissolve the regulatory structures that were essential for the life of the U.S. Republic. Looking deeper into his empty soul, however, we find what qualified him to play this role. You know, Greenspan was an accountant who, whose idea of economy was counting cardboard boxes, as he admits in his autobiography. And he said, if you have an increase in the orders for cardboard boxes, that means the economy is going to grow because people are buying more goods. Now, it's pretty stupid, but on the other hand, at least there was something physical about that. But the other side of Greenspan is this Ayn Rand fruitcake side this idea that you have to get rid of government. Ayn Rand was sort of a, a radical exponent of the Austrian school, of the von Mises, von Hayek, 
that government is bad in any form, that government has no role, and that it's the individual will to power, so to speak, the, the Nietzschean kind of idea, which, is a, which goes against every principle of the American Revolution and the preamble to the Constitution. Greenspan was one of her top adherents in the 50s through the 60s. Uh, he continued to admire her. I believe she was even brought to one of his uh, swearing when he was sworn in as in the, the Nixon administration. Uh, she had a nickname for him. It was the Undertaker. And that's totally appropriate because Greenspan served as the undertaker for the Franklin Roosevelt system. After serving under Richard Nixon, Greenspan would execute his next role through the offices of J.P. Morgan and Company, where he oversaw the crafting of the treacherous document. It was at that time that you had a major effort led by J.P. Morgan, the brokerage house, which was led by, among other people, Alan Greenspan, uh, who launched a major effort with the publication of a pamphlet called Rethinking Glass-Steagall. And that is when the drive to destroy Glass-Steagall really began. Uh, very interestingly, uh, if you read that pamphlet, and if you read sections of it, you know, for anyone who was in or around Washington, when Greenspan was, was chairman of the Federal Reserve, there's a, there's a dialect that he speaks um, called Greenspeak, for lack of a better term. It's very hard to understand Alan Greenspan when he talks. You know, I consider myself pretty sharp. I've been around Washington for a while, and I would always need an interpreter. When he testified before Congress, I was never quite sure what it was the guy was saying. And when you read this pamphlet, it jumps out at you. It jumps out at you that Alan Greenspan not only was an advocate and a sponsor of the effort, but that sections of the pamphlet were clearly written by him. But right after uh, the publication of this pamphlet in, oh, what was it, 84, Within two years, Alan Greenspan is chairman of the Federal Reserve. There are risks involved in underwriting and dealing in securities, and we decided that we would recommend the necessary changes only because we believe that a framework can be put in place that can assure that the potential risks from securities activities can be effectively managed. The purpose of the hearing is to get uh, Chairman Greenspan, uh, Greenspan's views on uh, what should be the restructuring of the uh, banking industry, if there should be a restructuring. Between now and March the 1st, uh, we're going to have to decide whether all bets are off or whether Congress should be a player in this and decide that commercial banks should get into the investment bank business. Uh, Chairman Greenspan is here uh, with a proposal that uh, we should indeed repeal the Glass-Steagall Act and. Uh, on August 11, 1987, Alan Greenspan was installed as the new Federal Reserve Chairman. This was just three months after LaRouche's May 1987 forecast, where he warned of a major collapse in the stock market beginning around October that same year. On October 19, 1987, the stock market crashed. It was the largest single-day loss in history as the Dow Jones dropped 508 points. Black Monday had come. Greenspan's entrance as chairman of the Federal Reserve would secure the bailing out of the system as his immediate solution to the 87 crash was to unleash the wall of money. Upon hearing the news in Dallas, Texas, Greenspan ordered the Federal Reserve to open up its lending window to banks and investment houses lending them as much money as they needed to buy up the collapsing stocks in an attempt to stabilize the markets. This monetarist approach of Greenspan would set the precedent for today's open casino stock market and later financial derivatives. Now this is where we see the real evil of Greenspan. What Greenspan was committed to was a shift from an industrial economy to a financial service economy. And Greenspan knew that investors were initially hesitant 
to put money into things which seem to have no value. See, in the United States, coming out of World War II, we had a sense of value. Value was in production. Value was in engineering skills and development. Value was in the ability to increase the productivity of labor, not by speed up, but by developing new technologies, by f innovation in technology. Skills. Yeah. And what you would invest in if you bought stocks or something like that is you knew that you were investing in a company that was producing something that had physical plant and equipment, that had engineering capabilities, that had uh, skilled workers. So even if the company went bankrupt, there was some real equity, some real value, real tangible assets to that company. So Greenspan came up with this idea, two ideas. You change productivity from goods production. Remember what I said earlier, that this idea that he at least counted cardboard boxes. Now you eliminate tons of steel per man hour or uh, uh, numbers of, of screws or bolts produced per man hour. And instead, you, you shift it to money. The GDP is, is a monetary aggregate as opposed to a physical goods production. And you assign monetary value to that. And so you divide the total GDP, the total money that's generated in an economy, by the hours worked to, to figure out what productivity is. So it's purely fictitious, it's purely money. We are on the verge of the biggest financial blowout in centuries. Bigger than the Great Depression, bigger than the South Sea bubble, bigger than the Tula bubble. The derivatives bubble in which Citicorp, Morgan, and the other big New York banks are unsalvageably overexposed is about to pop. The currency warfare operations of the Fed, George Soros, and Citicorp have generated billions of dollars in profits, but have destroyed the financial system in the process. What is required, as EIR founder Lyndon LaRouche has repeatedly stated, is a restructuring of the U.S. banking system, including the nationalization of the Federal Reserve, taking it out of the hands of the bankers and putting it back in the hands of the Congress as mandated by the U.S. Constitution. It is the welfare of the people which is paramount, not the maintenance of the speculative financial system. It's high time we put the speculators out of business instead of surrendering to them even further. That's the issue. We'd better deal with it and fast while we still have the chance. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for this opportunity to testify. The ultimate motivation behind every policy of the chairman of the Federal Reserve from the legalization of financial derivatives to his drive to repeal Glass-Steagall, was evil. Greenspan and his British imperial controllers needed increasing sources of money to continue feeding the insatiable parasite called the International Financial Monetary System. Looting the physical economy was not enough at that point. What was increasingly needed was open access to the assets of the commercial banking system, which, under FDR's Glass-Steagall policy, was still prohibited. Greenspan's first step in this mission was to undercut the principles of Glass-Steagall by employing a loophole found in the Bank Holding Company Act of 1956, which vested discretionary authority in the Federal Reserve Board to allow commercial banks to engage in securities trading. The 1956 Act was said to have been originally intended to strengthen regulation of bank-holding companies and restrict interstate banking. But the powers granted to the Federal Reserve Board would, not surprisingly, be abused by Greenspan, who undoubtedly studied the Act, very carefully. So with Greenspan at the Fed, they began a steady process of erosion of Glass-Steagall. Now in 1954, 55, 56, somewhere in there, uh, Congress passed a law called the Bank Holding Company Act. And it was ostensibly uh, a regulatory bill that placed certain prohibitions and clarified restrictions on interstate banking. But it also had a few loopholes. 
Uh, it gave a certain amount of discretion to the chairman of the board of the Federal Reserve to allow him to permit certain kinds of investment banking activity on the part of commercial banks. And so for a long period of time, commercial banks were uh, permitted to do 5% of their overall activity in areas that were really investment banking. Uh, under Greenspan, that 5% figure was increased to 10%, and eventually, under Greenspan's discretion, banks were given authority to earn 25% of their total revenue through activities that are really investment banking activities. But with Glass-Steagall still officially in place, commercial banks were barred from owning brokerage houses, insurance companies, and the like, despite the fact that they were increasingly engaged in securities marketing. In the eyes of Greenspan, those barriers had to be torn down. In 1998, this showdown finally came to a head. Travelers Insurance Company, uh, under the chairmanship of a guy named Sanford Vile, uh, made a move to merge with Citibank, one of the largest New York City commercial banks. And it happened that Travelers Insurance Company also owned a brokerage house called Smith Barney. And what happened is that Greenspan gave a temporary waiver and allowed travelers to take over Citibank in a merger that created a single entity that had a commercial bank, that had a brokerage house, and had an insurance company all under one roof. And so basically, what Greenspan said in this waiver was that uh, Sandy Weil and the others had a two-year deadline to come under Glass-Steagall compliance. But you know, then the Congress found itself between a rock and a hard place. Because even though some members of Congress knew better at the time, the fact was that either they were going to repeal Glass-Steagall or some of the mergers that were on the table would have to be dismantled. And so the Citibank Travelers combination took a leading role, but with the clock ticking down, every major Wall Street interest began pouring massive amounts of money into the repeal of Glass-Steagall. And the fear was that not allowing those mergers to go through would lead to a massive destabilization and a crash on Wall Street. It was complete idiocy on their part, because the fact is it might have led to a collapse on Wall Street, but it would have meant nothing in terms of the real economy of the United States. As J.P. Morgan, Citi, and others in Wall Street poured in millions of dollars of lobbying funds for the repeal of Glass-Steagall, Lyndon LaRouche was gaining increasing prominence as the leader of a global campaign to restore the fixed exchange rate system of Franklin Roosevelt, an economic system for the world which LaRouche dubbed a new Bretton Woods system. Therefore, the United States must act together with other powers to put the world into bankruptcy reorganization. Every financial system, every banking system in the world is presently bankrupt particularly those that are involved in derivatives. Huh? Therefore, the, the United States must take a leadership, uh, international leadership, in proposing a new Bretton Woods, which would be a good term for it, which is what I proposed. That we're going to go back to the principles of the Bretton Woods system in its best years, and the United States, as the principal prospective partner in such agreement, will try to get every nation that's willing to go along with this idea to assemble and do it. And those that don't wish to go along with it, that's just tough. We're going to go ahead with it anyway. In the same period, 
President Bill Clinton himself set off alarm bells in London and Wall Street when he announced to the Council of Foreign Relations in New York in September 1998 that the world had come to a point where it needed to consider a new financial architecture. To convene a, convene a major meeting of their counterparts within the next 30 days to recommend ways to adapt the international financial architecture to the 21st century. Though Clinton's new financial architecture was not LaRouche's new Bretton Woods, London decided that President Clinton had to go. Uh, I believe I've testified to this in the grand jury. Uh, in the best of my recollection, it was... Uh, the issue was never mind, Monica came, Lewinsky, was things, but that Bill Clinton had publicly announced his commitment as U.S. president to defend the sovereignty of the United States and to overhaul the existing global financial system, the very same system that the empire and its royal toad, Alan Greenspan, were desperately trying to sustain by eliminating Glass-Steagall. I don't think that there has ever been an operation against a U.S. president that was more explicitly authored in London than, than, the, uh, than the drive to impeach Bill Clinton. Uh, the entire thing was orchestrated uh, in the British tabloids before it ever became uh, a, a, an issue of, of popular concern here in the U.S. Uh, what, and, and it was identified as such. Uh, I remember James Carville, who was a political consultant tied to the, the Clinton machine, holding a press conference in Washington, D.C., with flowcharts showing that all of, all of the allegations going all the way back to, uh, to the Whitewater allegations against Clinton began in the British tabloids. And he posed the question then of, of why, why it was that the British were so fixated. Uh, but, you know, it, it stemmed from, on the one hand, Clinton's call for a new financial architecture, but also from the same ideology. One of the things that Clinton did as one of his first acts in office was uh, he said that as far as he was concerned, the special relationship between the United States and Great Britain was over. The empire had worked both ends. From the top, Clinton's ability to assert leadership as president was crippled as he was distracted by the impeachment drive and attacked from within his own administration by the likes of Gore. On the other end, the clock was ticking for either the merger of travelers and city to be voided and dissolved according to the still active Glass-Steagall, or for Greenspan and his like to succeed in repealing the law before the two-year window came to a close. Citibank and J.P. Morgan spent more than $100 million combined in buying up Congress to pass what would eventually become the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act of 1999, the bill that would kill Glass-Steagall. Finally, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act was pushed out of conference for a final vote on November 4, 1999. It passed overwhelmingly. An embattled president signed it into law. Responsibility that happened under AIG, we have made specifically illegal. And Glass Steagall, again, you have to understand this. The AIG was not a bank. Decency AIG and great strength. That I have never been more hopeful about America's future than I am tonight. fight to define the terms of a progressive common interest 
which is largely always associated with a really a physical economic What I'd like to first start out and, with, and, and before we start our discussion here, is that Lyndon LaRouche just gave a State of the Union address, which is going to be made clear that everything he said... <laughs> Uh, we don't right now really know what President Obama is up to, but we are being forced to vote on a package which is being negotiated without our participation and which, frankly, at this moment, uh, is, is a package... Otros motivos. No, todo esto es un fraude, un fraude completo, no tiene nada de verdad. El, el punto aquí es que lo que tenemos que hacer, y no hay sustituto para hacerlo, tenemos que imponer la ley Glass-Steagall. Si no, cualquier cosa que se esté haciendo es simplemente un acto de masturbación. Sin Glass-Steagall, uno no está actuando en serio. Primero, uno tiene que eliminar el sistema monetarista. Eso no es dinero. Sí, es dinero, pero es dinero sin valor. Nunca hay manera de pagar esa deuda, ese dinero. ¿Por qué a tener, a hacernos la ilusión? Nunca se puede pagar, no tiene valor. Es parte de los instrumentos que están destruyendo Estados Unidos y esa es la intención británica. Tenemos un títere británico como presidente de Estados Unidos, recibe órdenes de la reina de Inglaterra, literalmente, ¿Y ¿Quieren hablar de esto? Es irrelevante. Y pongan a la ley Glass-Steagall ahora. Y si no se está logrando esa ley, uno está perdiendo el tiempo, están perdiendo nuestro tiempo. Porque no hay manera de salvar a Estados Unidos del infierno en el futuro inmediato a no ser que se adopte la ley Glass-Steagall ahora. Tiene que ser así. El, el problema es que hay gente que se pone a hacer preguntas en base a los supuestos de que algo es la práctica aceptada y tratan de, as, de tomar lo que es la práctica aceptada y luego interpretarla para resolver un problema. Pero lo que se tiene que eliminar es la práctica aceptada del día. Uno tiene que pegar, meterle un tiro al enemigo, no a la pata de uno mismo. Ese es el problema, es exactamente ese. No se metan en, en, en estas cosas. Yo sé exactamente lo que tenemos que hacer y otros también saben. Hagámoslo y no cambiamos de tema a discusiones inútiles.